ブーギーナイツタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタッタFrom when she's commissioned in 1884, October, to when she's stricken in April 1912. 28 years. Technically, Free Nations owned her. Technically. Please note, technically. Realistically, too. And there's a whole Esmeralda affair in the middle. She is not big. She's not fancy. She's the first Ellswick class cruiser, or Ellswick type cruiser. And she's present at battles which shaped the fates of South America and at critical, critical to a battle which. Has shaped the modern world. And yet, when I start to talk about her in front of classes, usually the first question is, huh? Well, <clears throat> ain't she pretty? This is her in 1884. Yes, she's still got rigging. Yes, there is no one gonna call those lines anything other than functional. But that doesn't mean she's not pretty. Esmeralda was the work of George Whitewick Rendell. He was an engineer, a naval architect, and. He was William George Armstrong's right hand man when it came to designing ships and working in the Ellswick Ordnance Company.、Um, in fact, he's pretty much the one who designs almost all of the Ellswick Yard's cruisers. He's a very, very Successful naval architect. Now, the thing about the Esmeralda is that it had an arch steel protective deck running from stem to stern just below the waterline. So, all the vital parts of the ship were placed below this deck. That's part of its protection. Also, had cork filled cellular compartments to aid with buoyancy. And it is beautifully balanced. Beautifully balanced. He would build many ships, many vessels, and yeah. In 1882, he was invited by the then Earl of Northbrook, the then First Lord of the Admiralty, to become an extra professional additional Civil Lord of the Admiralty on the board of the Admiralty. He served in his post to 1885. He had many awards and he built a very, very cool ship. His awards included、um, the Watt Medal. The Order of Charles III from Spain,、uh, the Order of the Cross from Italy in 1876, and elected to a member of the Institution of Naval Architects in 1879, becoming Vice President in 
And although apparently not a Roman Catholic, he is actually married in, uh, buried in St Mary's Catholic Cemetery at Kensal Green in London. But no. Let's get back to Esmeralda. There is a lot of things going on when she is designed. There is the Japanese uh, cruiser Tushu, uh, Tushikishi, uh, no, Tushkushi, uh, Tushukushi, yeah, T S U K U S H I. It's kind of difficult for a British tongue to pronounce. There are people who have tried to work with me on it. Now, she was originally designed for Chile. But they cancelled, and Japan procured her. And this is a forerunner of what happens to Esmeralda. Esmeralda was heavily sold by William Armstrong. Um, this is a statement he makes to um, the Scotsman, which is republished in Valparaiso's The Record. He believed the Esmeralda was the swiftest and most powerfully armed cruiser in the world. Hopefully, she had passed... Happily, she had passed into the hands of a nation which is never likely to be at war with England, for he could conceive no more terrible scourge for our commerce than she would be in the hands of enemy. No cruiser in the British Navy was swift enough to catch her or strong enough to take her. We have seen what the Alabama could do. What might we expect from such an incomparably superior vessel as the Esmeralda? Now, please note, this is, of course, an arms salesman selling arms. But... In 1884, she has a speed of 18.3 knots. That's not bad. Now, we can talk about the Leander class. But, and she's launched in 1883. But, yeah, she's doing well. There are some cruisers out there, but would they want to fight her? Because she's armed with two 10-inch guns, which is scary. Six 6-inch six guns. Okay, that's now problematic. And two 6-pounders. Mm -hmm. And five 37mm re uh, revolving cannon. Okay, well, that, that, that makes us slightly more interesting to deal with. Now, she's today recognized as probably the first protected cruiser. Not an armored cruiser, not an unprotected cruiser, uh, the first protected cruiser. And uh, this is characterized usually by having a armored deck that protects vital machinery. And that's what she does. She has one inches of deck armor. Up to, really. Now, there are a lot of people who will put this down to various things, the Junicole. That is certainly a possibility. The writings of Mahan, Corbett, is another possibility. The lessons of the American Civil War certainly are a big factor. But myself, when I start to talk about these things, well, I don't think of this vessel as a Juno Cole vessel. There's a reason. The Juno Cole you build the armoured cruiser. That's your long-range, self-sufficient radar. Okay, you've got that. The torpedo boat makes sense as part of your flotilla. The unprotected cruiser, mm, that will probably do as your surface radar. It's cheap, cheerful, and you can use that to do things. The protected cruiser, well, where does that fit in that scenario? Or it can't match up against the armored cruiser. It can't give you anything like a chance versus a capital ship. Um, it can, to an extent, it's going to lose, but it can lose gloriously, damaging an armored cruiser. Okay. Uh, it can mop up unprotected cruisers. It's pretty much automatically a vessel of commerce protection rather than commerce interdiction. And considering what she'll end up fighting in, well, the War of the Pacific and the Russo-Japanese War, 
Hmm. It does rather fit with that rod. Now, the reason why all of this happens and this matters is because Chile and the South American nations as a whole had realized that if you're fighting a war in the Pacific and a war in the South American context, control of the sea would likely be a determining factor. Why? Because at this point, they don't have very good internal logistics, internal infrastructure, roads, railways, those communications. They rely on sea. If you rely on the sea for the movement of your goods, you need whoever has the best navy is going to win the war. Please note that Armstrong didn't just end with promoting the article and uh, promoting the ship hymns as Esmeralda himself. He did. Um, he also got a weighty article in the Times, which was anonymously written by Armstrong Mitchell's chief naval architect, and he invited the Prince of Wales, that's the future Edward VII, to visit the ship. They were very successful. And made the fortune for Armstrong's company. Now, there are some issues for Esmeralda. She's not necessarily amazing. She does have 10 inch guns. And as we all know, I have problems with 10 inch guns. In this period, they fit and are okay. But the more time goes on, the more problem you get with a 10 inch gun. But this is her as she's built. 2,950 long tons, that's near enough 3,000 tons. Length, 270 feet, that's 82 meters between the perpendiculars. Beam, 42 feet, 13 meters. Draft, 18 foot, 6 inches, or 6 meters. Four double-ended fire tube boilers supplying two compound steam engines with 6,803 indicated horsepower to drive two shafts for a top speed of 18.3 knots and a range of wherever a maximum of 600 tons can, uh, coal could get up. That's not going to be a massively long way, but it could be long enough. Complement 296, two 10-inch guns, six 6-inch six guns, two 6-pounder guns, 537mm, 1.5-inch revolving cannon. And up to 1-inch in depth. Mm -hmm. This is her design. Ten inch guns are four and a half, so well, you're not getting much out of them. Single guns, fore and aft, it, you might hit something. Probably won't much. Six inch guns on the broadside, they're your main killing weapons. Ten inch guns, they hit, they cause a lot of damage. Their main thing is that they act as a deterrent. It's, you don't have to fit torpedoes if you have those. Now, they were these ten-inch guns were able to be trained to either side of the ship, raised to an angle of twelve degrees, depressed to five degrees. They weighed twenty-five tons each, and the shells they fired weighed roughly two hundred kilograms. Required a powder charge of a hundred kilograms. The six-inch guns in the Vasseur central pivot mountings were, as mentioned, the main killing system on this ship. Ship was fitted for, but not with, three 14-inch torpedo tubes. Saving money by the Chileans. 
would have been interesting to see exactly how capable that whole system would have been, but you know. And the ship was not equipped with sailing rigging. By this point, it was not considered worth it. One of the interesting things is when she enters Japanese service, they remove, they change her name to Izumi. They fit her with two six-inch guns, 40 caliber, rather than the 26 caliber they had previously, and six 4.7-inch guns, replacing the six-inch guns, and three 18-inch torpedo tubes. These changes overall lighten the ship, and... Whilst its machinery could still manage six and a half thousand indicated horsepower, which meant you've lightened the ship and you've still got the same horsepower. Or, well, how to put it, you've only lost 300 horsepower. You suddenly become a still a very useful, very, very useful cruiser. Now, during the Chilean Civil War, which was her major thing, she arrived too late for other battles she might have been part of. Her and most of the Chilean Navy supported the Congressional Rebels against the rival presidential-led faction. Again, navies do tend to support their paymasters. But her commander, Pol uh, Policarpo Toro, refused to join the Congre uh, Congressionists and was replaced by a gentleman called Pedro Martinez. Um, she spent most of her time doing cruiser roles, uh, often wandering around with a corvette named Abato and two Amaranti Lynch class torpedo boats. Well, when I say wandering around them, she was trying to find them. Abapto joined the rebels. But interesting enough, when you look at a map of their charts, of course, is they're wandering sort of, oh, 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 you. <sighs> it's fun times. Then she went north to participate with the rest of the Congressional Squadron in blockading and controlling forts in that area of the country. Um, during the final phase of naval operations in the north, uh, she participated in the Battle of Ininke. Uh, their Congressionalist troops, outnumbered, managed to retain the strategic port thanks to the firepower of the squadron, which bombarded the positions of the presidential troops until they finally capitulated. Basically, there is the firepower you are bringing, and there is the firepower of these 10-inch guns. Because whilst they can't engage other ships, if I just moor myself off the coast and point in the right direction, I can hit something. It's not nice of me, but it works. Mm. Later on, she ended up in the Battle of Cocon. Again, engaging presidential ground forces. This is from the mouth of the Anconga River. The gunfire didn't kill many troops, and I'm not surprised. Again, you're trying to aim those guns, but it did demoralize them. As Scientific American put it, raised fearful havoc. I just love that, uh, that magazine. And then she went on to attack the forts of Vinda del Mar with the Amaranti Crocran, the Ironclad, which was successful, unsurprisingly. However, her service with Chile was not to last forever. In fact, it was going to be cut quite short. You see, the Chileans then noted that there was a f the first Sino-Japanese War. This is a terrible time for Japan. They need ships from everywhere. And the Chileans themselves are engaged in an escalating arms race between with them, Argentina and, to extent, Brazil. 
and they need to fund this. They want new ships. The Japanese want any ship. So, in November 1894, they sold the ship to the Japanese. Now, the Japanese used about a third of the funds the Japanese Company Parliament had, a really, had originally earmarked for the purchase of free Argentine warships, which they weren't able to sort of really get off Argentina. However, the Chileans wanted to remain neutral in the uh, Sino-Japanese conflict. So what they did was they used Peru, no, Ecuador, sorry, Ecuador. Why did I say Peru? I have no idea. It's been one of those days. This will probably get through just so I can show that occasionally when I have those days. Oh, the reason is because the Peru were, uh, Peruvians were upset about that. My notes fell down. Okay, so they include they induced the sort of Ecuador's president for a large amount of money to serve as an intermediary. Esmeralda was sold, sailed to Ecuador. Their navy would briefly take possession of the ship, so it briefly become Ecuadorian, and they would then sell it to Japan. Now, the trouble is this created speculation in the Ecuadorian Navy and in Ecuador that they would get this vessel for use against Peru, their mighty enemy. However, the ship was only under the Ecuadorian flag as far as the Galapagos Islands. And the president of Ecuador found this really caused him trouble because um, it added further anger to those people who didn't like him and led to the liberal revolution. Which was successful and got rid of him. Ouch. So, this means she enters Japanese service. And... When she first entered service, they replaced the 6-inch guns with the 4.7-inch guns. Then in uh, 1901, they replaced the 10-inch guns with the 6-inch weapons, as we discussed earlier. And they remained on as active standing with Naval Squadron. And the US Office of Naval Intelligence called it by far the most comprehensive training exercise ever conducted by Japan at that point, when they took part with the rest of the Navy. Um in 1901 in a massive exercise. It's always fun. When they went to war against Russia in 1904, well, after the Japanese cruiser Akashi struck a mine in December 1904, Izumi was deployed to the patrol line south of Thailand Bay. Now, what was she down there for? Well, she was down there to support the scouting line. And, well, I have a little outline of what she did that day. Izumi was assigned to the 6th Division of the Suez Squadron, under the command of Rear Admiral Togo Masaji and Vice Admiral Gato Shinkro. Izumi was assigned to support a line of auxiliary cruisers stationed in the Tashima Strait. The ships had task of spotting the Russian fleet. Unfortunately, due to various reasons, Izumi was actually more likely nine miles out of position on the morning of the battle. They had taken further task due to one of their vessels, the Shenan Omaro, basically carrying out... Mm, how do I put this politely? Its own version of the Kamkatcha. In that it decided it was going to say, I see, Ru I see Russians, when it really didn't. Me, as a result, it wasn't until 0630 hours that Izumi may finally made cont visual contact with the opposing Russian fleet. And she's the first actual warship to do so. This mean makes her very important. She's the first warship to spot the Russians. The proper warship. That has a proper crew who reported it through properly. They merely correct the previously mistaken supporting information and commence shadowing. They did this for several hours, 
correctly identifying the lead Russian flagship as a cruiser of the Izmir class and reporting their movements. Izmir also, during that time, warned off an army hospital ship and a troop transport that wandered into the path of the enemy fleet. It was only when the two fleets drew near for battle that Izumi was actually forced to abandon her post and turn away from heavy fire around the uh, 1350 hours. And she actually goes into the path of the battle. Despite my old professor's favourite naval historian, Julian Corbett, describing this battle and the cruiser involvement, the cruiser line as being ill covered, we do know. Now the cruisers take a big part in the battle. Um, at several points, Izumi and several other lighter ships from various Japanese squadrons are in close proximity to the heavy Russian ships. However, Izumi actually escaped with minimal damage. This was partially due to her design, partially due to her crew, and partially due to the fact that the Japanese battleships of the 2nd Squadron took umbrage every time the Russians started focusing in on their cruisers. And when I say umbrage, the Russians did not enjoy the response. Second Battle Squadron of the Japanese at Toshima proved to be particularly vengeful when they were uh, they took umbrage at something. After the battle, Izumi and the rest of her sixth division, which was mm, about four, it was supposed to be four cruisers. As a rule, it wasn't always four cruisers, but it was supposed to be four cruisers. Um, were deployed to support the invasion of Sankalin and escorting the army's transport ships. When the war was over in 1905, Izumi was for several years. Uh, for example, in 1906, she was she was the ship to transport the former prime minister of Japan and the first Japanese resident general of Korea, Ito Hiro Bumi, to his post. As said, in 1912, she was struck from the Japan's Navy list and was sold for scrapping in Yokosuka for 90,000 yen. Which is not that bad when you consider she was bought for 3.3 million yen. They got, you know, nearly two decades of use out of her, and a very big battle where she was very useful. Mm, you'd say value for money. So, Esmeralda, Izumi. Good ship? Bad ship? I'd say a pretty darn good ship. Very useful. Certainly earns its spurs as a warship. Like all these ships, it comes at a time of transition, and whilst it is used as the first protected cruiser, there are certainly other ships which were moving along the line towards it. One of the things I tried to make the point of when we talk about Dreadnought and various other ships is that it is rarely so stark as the history books, especially the general ones, will present it. It's very rarely a watershed moment, <gasps> this ship, and then all before it were terrible. Usually, there have been others have been moving along that path slowly edging in the direction and then a ship comes out which is the full way there and then that's considered the first that's why we have semi dreadnoughts that's why we have all those other ships around when dreadnought comes out that's why we have some very interesting designs of cruisers at various points because these ships are edging in that direction the specifications are sort of getting there but they're not quite there because i was quite sure what those specifications are going to be yet until someone gets it and cracks the formula, you don't really know. You're feeling your way, and you're feeling your way often by building ships, because you don't have all the computer-aided design tools, you don't have all those simulation systems you can use to check it all out. You are literally, your only option is to build it. This does mean some very interesting vessels are built, but it also means that you can argue quite consistently that the period of transition from the 18, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s is where you move from still an age of sail warship mentality to what a steam-powered warship will sort of look like and sort of mentality. And that's then very soon leads to Dreadnought and various on to 
the modern vessels we will see fighting for the next 50 odd years. Usually there is about a 50 year period of transition and then a 50 year period of stabilization where the designs are just improvements over what they were previously. It's an interesting world. Anyway, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, what was my question going to be? Hmm. You see, I'm really tempted to ask a Battle Toshima question. And it would be tempting to, but I'm going to couch it a different way. And it's to do with protected cruisers. I want you to think and please consider using any of the open source available. Even Wikipedia can skip through if you want to quickly to go go for it. It's not my favorite source because you can never be quite sure who's done the writing. Some of the pages are very well written, some pages aren't. Always go down to the sources at the bottom. That's what I always tell my students. Don't use the Wikipedia page, don't cite a Wikipedia page. Go down to the source list at the bottom and use them. That will tell you whether it's a good page or not, but it'll also be good sources for you, usually. Cross fingers and touch wood. But what I would like is we're discussing how cruisers are progressing in this series in this very videos. So I'd like to know what you think is the closest to being an almost Esmeralda. I want you to think about what is an almost Esmeralda. I know there are going to be many who are probably going to focus in on the Tushu, uh, Tush, um, Tushukushi. Tushukusi of the Japanese, but I don't think so. I don't think she's quite there. I think there are others, but I would like to hear what you think is the closest to an almost Esmeralda. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and uh, take care.